Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Reserve Bank and to our September monetary policy statement. The Reserve Bank has today left the official cash rate unchanged at 2.5%. The New Zealand economy has been performing reasonably well, while headline inflation has increased somewhat since our June review. At the same time, of course, global financial and economic risks have increased significantly. Domestically, well, domestic economic activity has been stronger than, we'd, than we had expected, and capacity usage has also gone up. We continue to experience high export prices, and the Christchurch reconstruction exercise is also going to strengthen activity over the coming years, though we do note that the Christchurch rebuild could take a little longer. Internationally, however, things are a bit different. The outlook for our trading partner growth has deteriorated markedly. Now there is a real risk that global economic activity could be slowing sharply. In addition, global financial market sentiment has now deteriorated. Sovereign debt concerns in Europe and weakened global outlook generally implies that international bank funding markets are tightening and that if the conditions don't improve, New Zealand bank funding costs will increase. Largely because the New Zealand economy has been doing better than many, the New Zealand dollar has strengthened since June. The high level of the New Zealand dollar is now having a dampening influence on parts of the tradable sector in New Zealand, but also on imported inflation. The annual um, headline CPI inflation continues to be above the bank's 1 to 3 per cent target band, but much of the spike, of course, has been due to last year's increase in GST and is therefore temporary. Wage and price setters should be focusing on underlying inflation, which is estimated to be much nearer to 2 per cent. If recent global developments have only a mild impact on the New Zealand economy, then it is likely that the OCR will need to increase. But for now, given the recent intensification in global and financial risks, it's prudent to continue to hold the official cash rate at 2.5%. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We're open for questions to assist as usual, Dr. Don McDermott, Chief Economist, and Dean Ford, Head of the Forecasting Team. Do we have any questions? Well, and how likely is it that um, global developments will only have a mild impact on the New Zealand economy? I mean, you say there is a real risk. Well, so far they haven't had a real impact on the New Zealand economy, so it's something we're, it's a potential that we're looking at. Uh, if we were to see problems, they could manifest themselves uh, more obviously through financial market contagion to financial markets being less willing to fund Australasian banks. We're not seeing that particularly at the minute. It's something for the future to keep looking at. Uh, if it were to go deeper, then it would start to feed into broader trading partner economic growth. And we don't want to see a situation where a slowdown in Europe leads to a slowdown in East Asian growth, because that clearly would impact New Zealand. Um, do you know uh, some doubts in the markets that um, policymakers offshore have got much ammunition left in terms of monetary and fiscal policy? Is that a view you share? Well. It is partly in the sense that um, and policymakers in some large economies have gone beyond orthodox monetary and fiscal policy, uh, have mounting deficits and uh, have been in the area of unorthodox monetary policy. So while there's always other things that can be done, I think the general view is that it's, it, one needs to think of broad government stimulus possibilities offshore is being quite limited now.
Um, you mentioned uh, that banks' funding costs have gone up, but that's not yet a problem because banks aren't in the markets. When do you anticipate that could become a problem? Uh, New Zealand and Australian banks are highly liquid. They've increased the maturity of their borrowings. That's been um, broadly in line with what we wanted to see. It's been assisted by us putting in place a core funding ratio and mismatch ratios after the global financial crisis. They're in much better position than they were back, say, in 2007. They've got plenty of liquidity. But having said that, uh, there isn't a lot of demand for credit at the moment. And in addition, the um, medium term markets for funding are not particularly healthy at the moment and the banks generally aren't going for those. They don't need to at the moment. At some stage they will need to and they'll need to look at that again. That's more a next year sort of story, not a this year story. Um, and if that does flow through to um, mortgage rates, do, is that just restricted to fixed rates? because it's term funding, or could that have effect on short-term floating rates as well, which most people are on? Well, I mean, of course, we've seen um, higher funding costs already, and they're in the system currently. If that were to worsen, then um, potentially it will go through into the, the mortgage structure, fixed or floating. It's not something we're seeing at the moment, uh, but it's always a possibility in the future. I mean, of course, we've got the, the normal range of monetary policy instruments to deal with that if we wish to. You're talking about the uh, possible increase in the OCR. Are you talking this year or longer term? Well, uh, we've been reviewing that all the way through this year. Last uh, June, we came out with a statement that said we feel that the OCR does need to increase, but it wasn't the right time to do it in view of international financial volatility. Uh, that international financial volatility has absolutely continued and so we still hold to that view. Uh, so at some stage uh, that will need to happen. That will depend on two classes of things. One is what happens offshore, talking about particularly Europe and not just Europe. And secondly, were we to see any um, growing um, evidence that headline, current high levels of headline inflation were feeding into expectations, feeding into prices and wages, uh, more directly, then we'd take that a bit more seriously as well. At the minute, we think that uh, those are their high headline numbers, but they're not really changing behaviours in New Zealand. That's pretty important. Of course, um, right at the moment, uh, we're just entering the period when uh, the headline numbers will come off a lot because the GST effects come out of the CPI. You won't see that formally until, I guess, early next year. But actually, over the coming quarter, we expect very little new inflation to come into the system. So what impact is the Rugby World Cup having on that? Uh, well, the Rugby World Cup, I mean, is a well-planned event, so um, it's not leading to particular price pressures. We don't think it is leading to some more economic activity. That's all a good thing. We've come out with forecasts that say we think that's in the nature of a growth revenue impact of around 700 million. It's, um, that's not a direct feed through into GDP. Uh, so I don't think we're seeing any surprises there. Of course, uh, your colleagues in the media have been very up and down on ticket sales and, and visitor arrivals, but turns out, looks like the rugby union were roughly right on that, Barry, and it looks like the budgets are roughly going to be met. So we're not seeing big surprises there. Forecasts don't assume much relief on the interest rate front. Is there anything you can do about that? Sorry, much relief meaning? Oh, sorry, on the exchange rate uh, front. Oh. Well, I mean, we continue to be in the situation where the exchange rate in New Zealand is quite a difficult feature. It's, we now believe, <coughs> significantly penalising some activity in the traded sector, hurting some New Zealand firms, and that's a sort of a medium-term effect, not a short-term effect. Um, of, of course, those who are able, once again, to take advantage of importing into US dollars and exporting in Australian dollars can do well out of that, but that's only a limited part of the traded sector. The silver lining in that has been that it's helped restrain imported price inflation. But basically, at the minute, as we've really seen over the last six months or so, the um, New Zealand dollar is just one of those currencies where the levels are being set by trade that's 
basically related to what's been going on in the major economies and we suspect that will continue for some time. You will see a number of other small open economies with their own exchange rates under some pressure here. You'll be observing that a number of them have been looking at other tools, most recently of course the Swiss National Bank looking at trying to peg the Swiss franc. We will watch that with considerable interest as to how successful that might be. Dr. Bollard, what's your expectation on the Swiss experiment? Do you think it's, it's something worth trying? Uh, we will watch it with interest. It's a bold experiment. Uh, Dr. Bollard, um, the forecasts for non-tradable inflation show it remaining significantly higher than tradable inflation. Do we have a structural problem? John, do we have a structural problem? Do you have anything in mind? I so when, you, when you say uh, when non-tradable inflation is consistently higher than tradable inflation, it seems that the export sector, the tradable sector, has to do all the work of keeping inflation down. I mean, there's, there's an underlying inflation pressures that are emerging as, as New Zealand's doing relatively well and is recovering from the previous recession. So that, that's what we're seeing on that non-tradable side. We're probably seeing uh, tradable inflation being lower than otherwise would be the case because we have a higher currency. It's just a simple case that imported costs are cheap. We, uh, I mean, I'll repeat what I've said before. We do believe that the New Zealand dollar is overvalued against long-term fundamentals and that um, the tradable, non-tradable split, although possibly overestimated in some of the, the data you see because of measurement problems, um, nevertheless partly does reflect that, that uh, persistent overvaluation. Uh, how would you feel if uh, the banks uh, were, uh, over time, to say our funding costs have increased because of the international financial crisis and therefore we're going to increase our mortgage rates even though you haven't increased the official cash rate? Well, if that's happening as a result of market forces and is indeed reflecting um, true increase in the cost of funds, then that, in our view, it's up to the banks to make their own judgments about where they set mortgage rates. We, of course, um, can react to that in terms of future uh, settings on the official cash rate, but no expectations particularly of that at the moment. Uh, Dr. Bollard, I'm just kind of curious, where does uh, global turmoil, where does it stop being a mild impact and turn into a severe impact? What's, what's the sort of thinking around there? Uh, well, from our point of view, it stops being a mild impact and turns into a severe impact if we were to see uh, funding markets uh, that Australasian banks go to for funding start to jam up. Uh, the sort of thing we saw in late 2008 after Lehman's, but not the sort of thing we saw in late 2007 after Northern Rock when there was considerable um, volatility and concern, but the Australasian banks were quite able to obtain funding. So more a another crisis of sorts. Well, that? I mean, that, that would be a financial interpretation. An economic interpretation would be if the downward pressure we're seeing on um, growth rates in Eurozone and in um, US to some extent were actually to continue and to start to lead to contraction in other exporting countries. I mentioned East Asia. East Asia hasn't been decoupled from all of this, but generally they've handled that pretty well so far and Australia and New Zealand are quite dependent.